Howdy, John. Okay. Howdy, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, here's our speaker. Excellent. Hello, Dave. Howdy. Howdy, Randy. I think Nick just came in. Okay. Sylvia and Mark. All right, looks like a good crew shaping up. So this is our November meeting of New Mexicans for Science and Reason. We're uh, just letting letting people into the meeting. Uh, but in a couple minutes, our, our speaker, uh, Nick Lamar Souter, will be speaking. He's already in the house. Okay. Uh, Nick, are you, are you going to need the uh, screen sharing and all that? Um, I doubt it. If I do, I, I know how to work it, but uh, unless there's something. Well, I think I'd have to make you a co-host. I think I'll, I can just do that in case we need to. All right. All right. There, there you go. You have the power. Oh, dear Lord. Okay. That's, that's more power than anyone should probably be giving me, but okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, give a couple minutes for folks to join in. So you're you're in uh, Massachusetts, right, Nick? Yes, I am. So just, uh, just outside of Worcester, which is the second largest city in Massachusetts. I usually yeah. just say Boston because that's easy. It's for people to – everybody knows where Boston is. Yeah. Massachusetts is small enough. You can get from one end of the state to another in about two hours three if the traffic is bad <laughs> I've, I've heard about the drivers there yeah, oh, yeah, oh yes yes um, effect, myself affectionately called mass holes i think connecticut is worse <laughs> but not by a lot um uh we do have our i think i think merging is something that people in massachusetts have a hard time that, with. they like to slow that's down that's what i've merging. heard about yeah yes that's that's not wise <laughs> But we're a progressive state, which I, I like. We were the, actually the first state to allow gay marriage. Um, and we, um, we uh, obviously, we beat uh, California. We beat a number of others. And uh, But I also like, I mean, I say progressive. Uh, our um, governor is a Republican, but a, a Massachusetts Republican is a liberal and most other. But I, I do like that Massachusetts is kind of that way. We are, um, you know, we're, we're I, I like to think we're, we draw from good ideas from all sides. Excellent. I have a question for the speaker. Okay. Uh, his perspective on the forerunner of Affordable Care Act. I understand Massachusetts had something like that when Romney was uh, governor. Yep. Put in when Romney was governor. How's that working out? Um, I think it works very well for Massachusetts. I think it's um, tough because it's not national. So um, uh, there are businesses that try to, businesses don't necessarily want to come to Massachusetts because uh, they are, they're on the hook for a lot of that um, liability. Uh, I, I, it's not as bad as I think many businesses make it out to be because, of course, in general, if you're if you're employed, you're going to have health care anyway through your business. It's it's small and medium businesses. I don't have a lot of experience in the, in that sector, so I don't know. But I do know in Massachusetts, we are happy with it. We're very happy with it. Uh, I think that doesn't mean we wouldn't want to replace it with a national version. 
but we, we you know that's because i think that's best for everybody in massachusetts would would find it even better but nobody here is talking about repealing it thanks all right well okay i guess uh, we can get started if uh, i'll be watching the um the audience there so if anybody else um zooms in i'll i'll let him in the door uh, but without uh, further ado, I'd like to welcome our uh, speaker, Nicholas Lamar Souter. Um, so we have a description about him in the newsletter, but he's uh, written uh, a neat book called The Water Thief. Uh, and he's uh, done all sorts of uh, commentary and analyses. And he's got a great uh, YouTube channel called uh, In Time that has uh, current news and, and analysis, or sometimes you know, it's uh, it's the uh, news uh, before you, you hear about it on uh, cable news networks, for instance, and other times it'll be um, pretty deep analysis of uh, things like church and state separation, uh, things like that. So, um, and uh, Nick spoke to us uh, earlier, uh, like way back in February, uh, before this uh, pandemic thing started. Uh, so, and uh, today's topic is just a, pretty much a, a freewheeling discussion. Um, the election, we thought it was over, but, but maybe it's not over. And, um, you know, what's, uh, what's going to happen to science under uh, a new administration, um, things of that nature. So, um, welcome, Nick. Thank you very much uh, for having me. I appreciate it. I enjoyed last time, although this is distinctly different, I guess, last time. I couldn't actually see anybody. I was just, I was, as I understand it, I was projected onto a screen and I could do my voice and there was a lot of people. And I saw photos later and you were in a big hall and all that. I was like, okay, yeah. things have changed. Um, but that thank you very much for having me. Pre-pandemic. Yes, yeah, sir. So, uh, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's basically it. The Water Thief was uh, uh, actually a, a rebuttal novel to Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Um, I uh, find economics, of course, fascinating. Um, uh, Midwest Book Review said it was uh, the, uh, uh, oh, wow, uh, should be required reading for everyone in the United States who questions authority in this country. Uh, and then I do the show. It's um, uh, in time news, politics, and culture. We do breaking news. We, we have, um, uh, we sort of have news sources, unofficial news sources. Um, uh, the, um, there's a, uh, in the, for the uh, South Korean cable, uh, one of one of um, their people actually reports to us. So even before they go live, we get news from them. So we were able to like uh, the, the example I give is when Iran, when Iran attacked the green zone in Iraq, we found out about it before any American news organization was broadcasting. And by the time we were broadcasting, Fox News was the only other Fox News of all news or not not NBC, not CBS. Um, not CNN, nobody else. It was Fox News, then us. We were the second. Um, and obviously, we're not a major, we're just a, we're a YouTube channel, and most people don't even know you can do that kind of thing with YouTube, but that's what we do live stream. Then we do interviews um, with uh, uh, scientists, philosophers, um, uh, stuff like that. And anybody who's got something interesting to say, our most recent one, which I was, I, I was thinking about, was a, a PhD in sociology talking about generations theory. <laughs> And um, we had on uh, Dr. Richard Carrier, who is a historian and is famous for coming up with a very credible argument. And I, I personally, I think Jesus Christ existed. I think he is a, a legit figure, but he comes up for a very good argument against that, uh, um, against the historicity of Jesus and says that Jesus was actually probably uh, fictional and didn't, it, but we had him on. It was a great, I'm not particularly religious, but you know, I was, I really, there is evidence he was there in my view. He's like, nope. So we covered that and that's it. And those are the kinds of uh, things we do. Um, we have a, a psychologist on next week to discuss, uh, we're calling the episode actually Rorschach. And it's how human beings, how we view, how people aren't as much the reality of who they are made up by their life experiences and their biology, but rather the biases that we impose on them and the expectations that we have of them. So every human being is actually a Rorschach test of what we see when we look at them. So that's going to be uh, on Monday. 
looking forward to that. And then, of course, we did a stream today uh, on what is, I got to tell you, if I was in another country, I'd be looking at that and saying, that looks an awful lot like an attempted coup d'etat. <laughs> so so we, had a, we had a big show today. Uh, so that's it. That's what that's what I'm up to. But thank you again for having me on. So. Oh, and um, OK, I seem you, to you not bet. be. Oh, there you go. There's Dave. And I can also see the chat. So I have the chat up. So if there's somebody who doesn't want to talk or drop a question into the chat, I can see that. All right. Looks like Sylvia is joining up. Taking a while. Coup d'état. <laughs> Coup d'état, yeah. So Dave, I'm on in a different computer, but the video isn't working. So I'm switching to another one. If you see me come in on the other one, just let me in and I'm gonna turn this other one off momentarily, okay? okay? That's, you're, that's Sylvia, right? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Well, I'll just, uh, whoever wants to get in, I'll, I'll let them in. Looks like you're Great. kind of stuck trying to, to join in your- Yep, exactly. Uh, just okay. because I'm a, uh, because I happen to be, uh, let me just see if I may be able to, just because I was made a co-host. So I'll see if I, I can, okay. I can't help but futz around I, with it. Nothing I can do from here except send good vibes. <laughs> Of course, this is this is hilarious because this is essentially what I do all day, every day, most most now. The YouTube channel we have um, hangouts, we have uh, you know groups. We'll get together. We for a while every Monday we were doing um, uh, stories from the pandemic, so it was just an open open call in. People could come in. They could come in through Zoom, through uh, uh, Google uh, Hangouts, and would just talk about their stories of what the lockdown was doing to them, to their families. Uh, anyone who had COVID would would and that that was it. We were just doing that every Monday for about two hours. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's funny now uh, when the girls have to do the remote learning as, as soon as they go to Zoom, let me in, I'm a YouTuber. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, uh, didn't, uh, didn't you, uh, folks have a, have the COVID, um, correct? I, I, I did. House? I did. Um, we did. Um, the children were oh sick for. 15 minutes um the, the girls the girls were fine the wife wasn't feeling well for a day or two i got hit very very hard and um i don't remember much of a month and a half and um i did actually i did a stream specifically on that because a lot of people noticed my absence now in time does have some co-hosts and people were able to run it without me but um uh, my, my absence is, is, is pretty noticeable on the show, but uh, afterwards we, we did a stream sort of on my experience and um, how serious it got. I was actually in triage um, uh, and they decided not to admit me because my pulse ox was one point. I was at 90 and they said, okay, if it drops to 89, you're in, but at 90, they're like, we can't, they're like, we just can't. This the state was, was not overwhelmed yet, but it was getting there. And um, they're like, right, if, it's, if it gets below 90, then we can put you on a ventilator and that's it. But that'll get you back up to about 90. That's all anybody can do. So since you're not below 90, stay at home. And uh, that, was, uh, that was rough. And then what was rougher was realizing that we ostensibly can get it again. We do know that people have gotten it uh, repeatedly. We actually have had the first confirmed case of a woman. She was 90, died from her second round of it. She survived it the first time, died the second time. But um, there is evidence that even though you don't maintain the uh, antibodies, uh, there are other immune responses that do work. So you do have a, a resistance to it the second time around. That's theorized as of yet. Nobody's, nobody's um, proven it. But my hope is I'd really like to see. I mean, I think Biden's going to handle this much better than, than Trump. Um, I think I think. I, I, I do lean liberal and I try to be careful with new audiences, but I will say in this, in this case, I, yeah, I think, I, I, I think Trump has handled this rather poorly. Biden can't deal with it right now because his um, uh, transition team has been locked out. And uh, Trump is saying that he's not, he's just essentially not recognizing the election. So uh, that the secretary of state, essentially the secretary of state, 
somebody asked the Secretary of State about the transition. Secretary of State said we will have a very smooth transition to Trump's second term. Um, now, I understand. I don't appreciate it, but I do understand if a Secretary of State says, hey, the results haven't been certified yet, or if they say, hey, um, we actually haven't voted for president yet because technically we haven't, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of it. Um, that doesn't happen until the electors pass their ballot because you and I don't vote for president. We just don't. Uh, it's the electors who do from the electoral college. We vote for electors. The states divvy up the electors however they choose. Um, usually it's based on, on the vote, but technically the governors of many states could just sit there and say, eh, I'm giving them all to uh, Kanye West. Um, I wish that was a joke. Um, hmm. And then, uh, uh, what was I going to say? So uh, my hope is that Biden will deal with it. But the Biden transition team has said, listen, you know, their, their goal is to get the CDC back up and running the way it's supposed to. They can't because they don't know what Trump's done to it because they're locked out of the presidential daily briefings. They're locked out of the entire White House, all of it. So we'll see. So, uh, Nick, do you think uh, Trump will um, maybe he won't concede, but do you think he'll he'll stop uh, opposing the the transition at, at some point? At maybe uh, after in a couple of weeks when all the states certify their uh, totals, there. I don't know. Um, I am very confused. Um, to cover roughly what's happened, just so people have an idea. Um, so the New York Times. Uh, did a story today uh, in which they they say that they have called election officials from every state in the union and that they have called ones on both Republican and Democratic side in each of those states. And in not one case did they say that there was a credible, uh, did those people who they were interviewing say that there was a single credible claim of irregularities sufficient enough to affect the outcome. So it's it's pretty well determined now who won. Normally what happens is the transition starts at this point, all this other stuff. Um, <laughs> I have a question on that. Do you? Yes. Um, the the head of the um, the GSA is a Trump appoint a Trump uh, appointee. Yes. But do you have any sense of whether she would actually, you know, given this uh, informal canvas of state uh, election officials, she would go ahead and, and open up the transition? She has indicated that she's not going to. She's she going to wait not. the electoral college result? She didn't say she would. She has said, as of this moment, she has said she will not um, sign off on the transition. If she doesn't, that means yeah. they don't have access to the offices. So they set up in an office adjacent to the White House. They set up there and then they just move over to the White House right. when it's right. time. She, she won't sign off on it. Now, I don't know under what I a lot of this is people didn't actually expect anyone to do this. So there aren't laws against this kind of thing, because this is just, you know, normally you prep everything once the once it's just been established. Right. She she I don't know that she's even legally required. Um, or if she is, I don't know at what point. She Maybe she's legally required the day before. The problem is uh, uh, it was, I think, uh, The Atlantic followed by um, Vanity Fair did on October 23rd, did a story on um, leaks from the Trump campaign saying that what they were actually going to do was attempt to get governors to send the electors for the electoral college to the GOP. Now this is not faithless electors. So what a faithless elector is, is when um, the GOP gets their electors and they say, okay, we're gonna vote for Trump. And they send the electors uh, to vote. And then one of them, two of them vote for Biden instead. They were, they're supposed to vote for Trump. Instead they voted for Biden. Okay. But really what happens is electors are given to a party. That party then fills those seats with anybody they want to. Now, usually they use people that are dead, rock solid loyal so that you know they're going to vote the way. And many states now are adopting laws that say you have to vote the way you're told to by the people who own the seat. In this case, it's Republicans who are going to own a portion of the seats and Democrats who are going to own a portion of the others. But in many states, there's no law regarding how those electors are actually distributed. It's done by the governor and the governor follows guidelines, which which in most states is 
um, they award the entire bank of electors to whoever wins the popular vote. That's what they do. But in a number of states, they're not required to do this. So what Trump apparently has been doing, and now uh, the New York Times, Washington Post, and a few others in the last two or three days have confirmed, they are attempting to get governors. They're just going to the governor saying, you know, they're going to Republican governors saying, you know, that if Biden gets this, it's the end of the country. So I'm calling in favors. Send, regardless of how the actual vote turned out in your state, send all the electors to the GOP. They go to the GOP. GOP assigns them to, uh, uh, to vote for Trump. Boom, he's won. Um, now, that's unprecedented. And if that happens, I'm really scared about our democracy because what that means is the point of deciding a president really genuinely is no longer the ballot box, it's the governorship until the laws are changed because the governor can override the, what his state determines. Right now, in general, most governors probably aren't going to do that because they don't want to be lynched. Imagine if your state went blue and you hand all of the electors, even one more elector than they deserve, to um, uh, the Republicans. Your political career is probably over. Does that mean it's not going to work? I don't know. But Right now, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of State said, I, I said this earlier, um, there's going to be a smooth transition to a second Trump term. Now, that's not the Secretary of State. That's not supposed to be a political position. Um, obviously, it, it is political, obviously, but in a very different way. It's, it's Can a, I interrupt a, you there a moment? Please, I have a please. question about that. Uh, in yes. viewing that video clip, he said that with a smile on his face. And he continued to talk, but the clip stopped. What did he say after that? Um, I After that, he was asked a follow-up question about... Um, no, he was continuing to talk. Oh, oh, oh about the... Okay, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what he said after that. I only know that specific quote. From, yeah, no, me yeah, too. But I time. was hoping for more. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't... I mean, the problem with that is if he really wants to be, get cute... I can understand and see as a justifiable position, Trump has not lost the election because the electors haven't voted. That is, in my view, uh, that's tight, but it's justifiable. I, I don't approve. I don't think he should. We know who won. We know how this process works. We've done it a lot. Nonetheless, it's justifiable. But saying essentially that, that Trump will be in, turn, in office uh, next year, um, that seems to me to be a secretary of state for ostensibly the most powerful country in the world, denying that there was even a vote. Now, when the Secretary of Defense was fired, right before he was fired, he gave an interview to um, uh, Military, uh, what's it, uh, magazine, the um, uh, Military Times, I think it is. Um, and he said, um, quote, uh, he was uh, he was opining on the fact he would probably be fired. Now you don't you fire people when you come into the administration, not when you're leaving. You put in your own people when you come in. You let you let the old people go. You put in the new guard, the people that you want. He's firing people as he's going, which is which is odd. There's a couple of possible reasons for this, but uh, what he said was, uh, "Who's going to come in behind me? It's going to be a real yes man, and God help us." So that is a Secretary of Defense saying, "God help us. God help this country." if uh, the president does what he anticipates. Now, my question is, why did he say that? The only thing I can think of is that Trump asked him to do something and he said no. Um, and that's why he got fired. Now, he is empowered to say no to the commander in chief only under a very small set of circumstances. In general, if, the, if what he's being asked to do is either illegal or if it violates the constitution, which means it's probably one of those two. Now, we know that Trump wanted to invoke the Insurrection Act and start getting military troops on the ground in U.S. cities to fight the protests, the riots, all these other things, which are still going on. The news isn't covering them, and they're not quite as big as they were. But he's been dying to do that, and the military has been giving him serious pushback on that. Well, now he's gotten rid of one of the people who wants to do that, one of the people who's, who, uh, whose advice he's not fond of when it comes to Afghanistan. So the question is, is he now going to ramp up the war in Afghanistan? Is he going to do things that ostensibly is illegal, but a yes man would allow? That is an inference I don't know that, but I have to wonder why, before he was fired, he said, God help us if we get a real yes man in my position. 
I think Trump asked him to do something. The other thing that's been floated is possibly Trump said, are you going to defend the White House when they come get me in January? <laughs> um, <laughs> now, that sounds pretty crazy. But on the flip side, his level of denial, there was a, a, an interview. So the um, uh, let's see. Uh, James um, Anderson, who is the acting undersecretary for defense policy, has been fired. Originally was reported he quit. No, he was fired. So we've lost uh, two or three undersecretaries, a chief of staff, secretary of defense, all gone in a 32 hour period. Um, now, as he left, he was given a clap out and people were just clapping and cheering. The White House called and asked for the names of everybody who's clapping for him so they could fire them. Trump allies are saying now that they expect the CIA director, Gina Haspel, and the FBI director, uh, Christopher Rye, to be replaced by the end of the week. So um, he has now also, he's added a new, um, the, the general counselor to the NSA has been a spot that's been unf unfilled for a little while. He has now added a person who has been deemed one of the most loyal people in Congress to Trump. He was certainly the most loyal member of the Intelligence Committee has now been appointed by Trump to um, the NSA's um, general counsel position under the explicit objection to the director of the NSA. Now, here's the interesting thing. I also think that Trump probably has a tremendous amount of legal liability. I think he's in very big trouble. I think he's probably in, in trouble for money laundering. I think he's in trouble for taxes, but he can't get nailed while he's president. So I, there are a lot of people who are sitting there saying, well, this is a coup d'etat. He's trying to hold on to power. And I do think there's some of that. I think there's some vengeance. I think he doesn't want to blame himself for losing the election, so he's firing anybody he blames. And I think he realizes once he goes out, the New York Southern District, a number of others, uh, Virginia's um, attorney general and a few others are going to probably come after him. And so he's trying to stay in as long as he can. But um, it, it's There's state really... attorneys general too. Yes, a number of them, Virginia, uh, DC, um, New York, um and yeah, uh, yeah at least they got that. the foundation and you know they can they can uh, aspire higher well the i mean uh, 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 uh what's his name Mueller did that on purpose so one of the things that Mueller did when he was doing his report was he worked very closely with all the state's attorneys general and he did this because trump cannot be pardoned for state crimes he can only be pardoned for federal crimes so what ends up happening is trump can't make a deal he can't he can't go to pence and say okay i'm gonna bail you pardon me. He can do that for federal crimes, but all of the state's attorneys general are, are have been completely read in on all of Mueller's work so they can continue it at the state level. Um, in general, states don't like to do that because it's much rather the federal government foot the bill. But I think these states want him. So I think that's what's going to happen. They just have to wait. But also judging by what happened with the taxes, I think he is in immense legal trouble there. Um, so, but I, I, okay, so the White House, White House has been preparing um, next year's budget. And the way they've been preparing it is under the assumption that it's going to be presented um, by Donald Trump. So they're, they're literally working as if it's business as usual. And what concerns me is that is not what somebody who is clinging for their last grasp, last straw, maybe we can do. That's somebody who's in denial of the reality. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned because I just, I don't know how, how your, your basic question, which I've taken 20 minutes to answer was, you know, is, is the um, uh, uh, director of uh, the general service administrations, Emily Murphy, is she going to sign off on the transition? And at present, I see no evidence that they will do anything up until the day he's removed office to assist in this in any way whatsoever, and are in fact undermining it. It was the- um, You mean as late uh, as January 20th? Yes, yes. I, I think that's a distinct possibility, unless the other, the other possibility, which I think is, he's gonna be in Mar-a-Lago, and I'm wondering if once he gets to Mar-a-Lago, he's just gonna say, you know what? screw it I'm, I'm done and it doesn't come back to the white house i think that's a, a possibility too but as of this moment he is acting like a man who fully expects to be in office next year but uh, right. house services uh, chairman adam smith said it's hard to overstate just how dangerous high level turnover at the department of defense is during a period of transition top policy officials uh uh uh, in the Department of Resigning after the Defense Secretary was fired could mark the beginning of the gutting of the DOD, something that should alarm all Americans. And so what you have, yeah. Uh, 
The Republicans keep the Senate. What's to stop him? What's to stop him? Oh. Well, they may or may not keep the Senate. There's going to be at least two two seats uh, runoffs uh, runoff in January. What's to stop them? Um, my my hope is uh, the fact is Mitch McConnell has done. I am really not a fan of Mitch McConnell, but <laughs> he was better than the Secretary of State because uh, at least what he said was Trump is within his rights to fight this legally, which he is. Um, okay, that's better than the Secretary of State saying, "Oh yeah, he's going to have a smooth transition into his next term." But um, they have already done a resolution saying that they will abide by the results of the election. So that's the Senate has done that. The House has done that. Now, um, the reality is the, um, the closest that could possibly come, they have no say in the matter, the closest that could possibly come. And this is a mild concern. I have thought about this. Once the states have their votes and once the electors have voted, the um, head of the Senate is required to certify that vote. That's Pence. Now, um, Pence is the head of the Senate as the vice president. I, th I've always said this, okay, and this is true, people always, I would greatly prefer Pence to Trump. Now, um, I, I am, well, here's, here's, and I get that a lot. I get that a lot. <laughs> Let me try to sell you on this for just a second. Here's why. Here's why. Pence works within the system, all right? I, he, Pence is further to the right than I am. So there's, there's me on the left, there's Trump, Pence, okay? I'm, I'm well aware of it. And I, 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 I work with the uh, 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 Freedom From Religion Foundation. So fundamentalists are a little bit of a thing for me, okay? So I, I totally get that. But he works within the system. He works within the checks and balances. He doesn't try to upend it. He doesn't try to overturn it. He doesn't fundamentally undermine things like the right to vote. Our biggest defense against Pence, against Trump, against anybody who's an extremist, anybody who, our biggest defense is the right to vote. And here's a guy who's basically pretending like the election didn't happen. Uh, he is challenging it. By the way, they're not sending their A-list attorneys to challenge. Rudy Giuliani's in Pennsylvania to challenge this. Do you think anybody there thinks that that's going to work on a legal challenge? That's for show. The question is, what's he really doing? Now, he, the, the thing that I think he may do is just, I, the other thing he may do is play victim. He's good at this. You know what? If uh, the Dems really want to cheat that badly, they can have it. They can go burn this country down. No, fine. I, I won't. I'll, I will let them have it. I will let them have their win for and then, and then storm off indignantly. That was sort of my expectation from the beginning. But uh, make when it comes to policy, I am much closer to Trump by a long shot than I am to, uh, to Pence. But Pence isn't going to burn the country down. In fact, he values the country. I don't think Trump values anything but himself. So I would prefer four years of Pence to four years of Trump. And this that's happening right now is precisely why, because here's the next thing that happens. We are undermining all our ability. Let's assume he really goes after these delegates through the governors. Let's assume he has even a margin of success. Our vote isn't significant anymore. All of the advertising that you see on TV, vote for this person, vote for that person. It's not going to be targeted to you anymore. It's going to be targeted to your governor because he's the only one who matters. All of a sudden, there are 50 people in this country who determines who the president is, and that's the governor of each state. The only thing stopping that is if Trump isn't allowed to do what it looks like he's going to try and legally has a shot at. Pence would never, wouldn't have crossed his mind. So um, anyways, that's why. But uh, that, that's my pitch for it. I, I, I do. Uh, but uh, keep in mind, I'm, I'm reasonably. Yeah, I'm liberal, but I'm also reasonably vanilla. I'm not I'm, I'm not homosexual. If I was, I might have some much more problems with Pence. I, I so I mean, I do I do get that there are personal reasons uh, to have even greater difficulty with Pence. But just from a um, pe pe the other thing, Pence, I would never feel, you know, really uncomfortable is like fourth week in office. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys know what the nuclear football is, but it's it's a briefcase that has all the nuclear launch codes. It's never more than 50 feet from the president. It is never more than 50. It is, nev it is never more than 50 feet from the president ever, period, end of discussion. There is a Secret Service officer who guards that thing, and his job is to protect that over even the president. 
rest of the Secret Service is protecting the president. His job, if he has a, a chance of saving the president or saving the football, he saves the football. That's his. That's his job. So um, Trump goes and grabs an eight-year-old kid and goes, "Hey, that over there, that's the nuclear football. That's got the launch codes." He does this in earshot of the entire press corps. This was before he just had them all go. And I'm sitting there going, "What kind of idiot?" announces the existence uh, and, and look it's an un, everybody knows about it everybody knows but he's identifying where it is who's got it it's like yeah that guy who has his name's tony right there and he's got the hair and um you know it turns out you know you can actually i know they say it takes two people to open but really if you do both simultaneously <laughs> did you realize you could open the thing the codes by the way it's hilarious the get this i changed the nuclear launch codes the code is you're fired <laughs> ah, isn't that great? I, I'm okay. I see Trump doing that. I don't see Pence doing that. Yes, but but on the other hand, I I, I know what you're saying, but Pence to me is really the more devious one of the two. He doesn't tell you what he's going to do. He's very quiet <sighs> in his own way, and if he can, he'll put in a theocracy. And of course, women. Are, are not even in, in terms of voting, it, it'll, it won't even matter because the, the, the laws that will be put in, the rules will always uh, be there to keep women from uh, being people. So I know what you're saying about uh, Trump and, uh, and he is a very scary man, but I am more scared of people who may smile nicely at you and yet stab you behind your back every time. And that's who I think he is. Yeah, he's, he's, he's basically the demonic Ned Flanders. Um, and, <laughs> um, but I mean, again, I, and I completely agree. He would, I mean, listen, he would turn this into, I mean, I assume you know what a, sh a Sharia Caliphate is, which is it's basically, yeah, okay. So he would basically turn this into the Christian version of a Sharia right. Caliphate. So I, I, I've got no doubt. But the thing is, he would still respect the laws of the Senate. He would respect the judiciary. He probably wouldn't have actually even gone along with Mitch McConnell's uh, plan to uh, now he, he didn't have a choice. It was Mitch McConnell was under the Obama presidency, but what they did to Garland. He is a pretty much a play it by the rules kind of guy. So, um, uh, yeah, I still I still I'd, I'd rather somebody who, who uh, it, what Pence wants he doesn't have he doesn't have the balls to get. He doesn't because he's he's too he's still too Christian. He's still too well. And yes, I'm aware. Apparently, this is a Christian nation founded by Christians. This is what I have been told more than once. Believe me. Um, but um, the reality is that Pence still is a play by the rules kind of guy, and um, those are much easier to defeat when the numbers are in your. With the Senate the way it is, Pence, Pence could roll back some stuff and make life a little bit difficult. But when you consider what Trump has done with NATO, when you consider what he's done to the CDC, how many women have died? We're, we're up now to 240 some odd thousand deaths. We're getting now um, over 113,000 new infections every day. Pence would have got that right. I'm sorry, but he well, he would have gotten it closer to right than uh, Trump by a long shot. Um, what happens I, when the country gets so scared? What happens when, if you want people, if you want to turn a country into any kind of religious fundamentalist state, easiest way to do it is terrify the living daylights out of the people. COVID hasn't even done that yet. It should have. It's terrifying me. There are plenty of people who aren't yet. They will be. Um, they, they, at, at, at the rate, everybody here, I assume, also understands how COVID works. So we're seeing a huge spike. We have now seen a, a record 113 new infections a day. That started, that spike started about two to four days ago. So in 10 to four days, sorry, in about 10 to 12 days, we're going to see a huge spike in, in hospitalizations. Most of the hospitals in this country are reaching capacity. So think it, it, it's going to get bad, I think. Um, I think well, we're already killing nearly 6,000 a week. Uh, and it's going to go up, as you say, yes. because that's a sharply increasing curve. Yep. So, um, um, and then if 
and you see, here's the thing. I think this is what Pence is doing. And in this respect, yes, Pence is more dangerous because here's what he's doing. Pence is very clever in one respect. He is making Trump aware that he's loyal, but also making it clear that there are some things he won't do and he won't when Trump does something really off the rails, he won't come out publicly and, and support it. So uh, Pence is keeping his nose clean. The reason he's keeping his nose clean is so that he can grab power as soon as everything collapses. I'd just as soon give him that power while all the uh, institutions are intact. I'd, I'd give him that power when people could vote and say, oh my God, we this religious lunatic who can't have dinner with another woman without his wife present. Um, oh dear Lord. Um, you know, he's, 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 a, a, he's actually a demonic boy scout, but, um, I, anyways, I do, I, I, I do, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to try to undermine or suggest I, I just have, I have very specific reasons for why I really would have preferred Pence and Pence is waiting until the system does start to collapse, then he comes in and rescues it. But that's when he's dangerous. He's not dangerous when everything's running the way it should be. Trump is dangerous when everything's running the way it should be. When everything's going crazy, Trump can be never been that way since he's been in. Uh, uh, Nick, um, I've got that uh, Pompeo, um, like a three minute uh, video on on his statement. Do we want to check that out? Oh, I'd love to. Let's hear it. Let's uh, turn the sound on. And uh uh oh, I think I might have just lost it. It's showing up on my screen. Okay, okay, here we go. I, uh, I can probably screen share it too, but it's up. Uh, here we go. Is the State Department currently preparing to engage with the Biden transition team? And if not, at what point does a delay hamper a smooth transition or pose a risk to national security? There will be a smooth transition to a second Trump administration. Right, we're, we're ready. The, the world is watching what's taking place here. We're going to count all the votes. When the process is complete, there'll be electors selected. There's a process. That's the Constitution lays it out pretty clearly. The world should have every confidence that the transition necessary to make sure that the State Department is functional today, successful today, and successful with the president who's in office on January 20th a minute afternoon will also be successful. So you believe there's widespread voter fraud, that the reports that we're getting from Pennsylvania, from Michigan, showing vote totals and massive leads or significant leads with 99% reporting are going to be overturned and that the United States failed to conduct a fraudulent free election? Rich, I'm the Secretary of State. I'm getting calls from all across the world. These people are watching our election. They understand that we have a legal process. They understand that this takes time, right? It took us 37 plus days in an election back in 2000, conducted a successful transition then. I'm very confident that we will count and we must count every legal vote. We must make sure that any vote that wasn't lawful ought not be counted. That dilutes your vote if it's done improperly. Got to get that right. When we get it right, we'll get it right. We're, 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 we're in good shape. Should foreign leaders right. not be calling we're, we're, we're President-elect Biden? Give us next. This department frequently sends out statements encouraging free and fair elections abroad. Yes. And for the losers of those elections to accept the results, doesn't yeah, President Trump's refusal to concede discredit those efforts? That's ridiculous. And you know it's ridiculous. And you asked it because it's ridiculous. Uh, look, the truth, the tr- you, you, you asked the question, yes, ma'am. You asked the question, if you, if you will permit me to answer it. Um, you asked a question that is ridiculous. This department cares deeply to make sure that elections around the world are safe and secure and free and fair. And my officers risk their lives to ensure that that happens. They work diligently on that. We often encounter situations where it's not clear about a particular election. We work to uncover facts. We work to do discovery to learn whether, in fact, the outcome, the decision that was made reflected the will of the people. That's our responsibility. That's what we try to do, along with partners all across the world, along with OSCE inspectors, to make sure that those elections were free and fair. We want every one of those votes to be counted in the same way that we have every expectation that every vote here in the United States will be counted too. It is totally appropriate. The United States has an election system that is laid out deeply in our constitution, and we're gonna make sure that that we get that right. And we have, we we have, all of you have, and should be committed to making sure that that happens. I think every one of you wants that same outcome. You want every vote to be counted. You wanna run the process. We want. Uh, the, the law to be imposed in a way that reflects the reality of what took place. And that's what I think we're engaged in here in the United States and is what we work on every place all across the world. 
Thank you all. What I find interesting about that. I think that was okay, it. Okay, so yeah, what I find interesting about that is notice he doesn't ever state that there are questions. He doesn't state that people aren't sure. He actually has implied several times that he's sure what the outcome is going to be once the process is done. So it's like once the process is done, then you know everything will be okay. What does he mean by everything will be okay? Does that mean that the this country will be okay? Or does that mean that the Trump presidency will be okay? Because the way the question was framed, I got the impression that what he was saying is the Trump presidency will be okay. Everything will be okay. His job, everybody who works in that administration will be okay after all of these legal challenges are done. Uh, he didn't. He didn't seem to have any doubt there as to as to what was going what was going to be the final outcome, but it just needs to go through that process. I will say also. Yeah, he's the Secretary of State, which means he's responsible for the embassies. Uh, now, uh, a number of uh, embassies are reporting that the officials there have been told to stay clear of efforts to help President-elect Biden uh, uh, engage with foreign leaders who wish to congratulate him. And uh, diplomats are saying they won't even discuss successes of the Trump administration, which I imagine is probably a reasonably short list. But nonetheless, the successes of the Trump administration, they won't discuss them for fear of accidentally saying it in the past tense and getting fired. That's how... That's how much they're putting a clamp down on on this kind of it's um, yeah, but I mean, I, I think he was kind of grinning. I agree he was grinning. I don't think he was grinning on the on the first question, but he was he was grinning towards the second one. But I think I think that's because I think that was a pretty smooth transition. I mean, I did not take your take out of it. I took okay. kind of a neutral take because he knows he is still a, a Trump appointee and he could be fired tomorrow if he had done what you wanted him to do or what the uh, re the reporters wanted him to do i still have a well, little bit of hope in him well what i think he i uh, yeah i agree he's a trump appointee but his his loyalty is supposed to come to the constitution first agreed and, but he is still a trump employee yeah. and if he goes wrong he'll go out the door like esper did oh i agree but then go out the door like Esper did. I mean, the reality is too, first of all, your Trump, your Trump is almost certainly, I mean, I don't know what he thinks, but Trump is presumably going to be out of office um, in January. That's my take. All he, ha all, he ha all he has to say is, we don't know yet. That's he what he said, that. I thought. No, that's not what he said. What he said is, when the process is done, we'll have a, a, a resolution, we'll have the right resolution. He said that very carefully. What I took him saying there was he's not going to he, he won't confess. He's he is. He was. If, if you listen very carefully, that's a lot of lawyers speak in that. A lot of diplomats speak, too. He never once actually said we don't know. He never even suggested we don't know. What he suggested is that once everything's done, we we will have. The, the complete transition that you're supposed to have and the transition that he said at the beginning that we're supposed to have is to a second admin, uh, Trump administration. Um, right. That but, was my, you know. yeah, well, that was, that was tongue in cheek in my take. I mean, the, what he said well, afterward I think, I think was it, more, I, was more import has more import than that, that throwaway at the beginning. I mean, he got I set up, he was being asked to say something that would, would actually get him out the door and nobody knows who would get in in his place in these critical days remaining. So I, I think that was a pretty good thing uh, when you hear the whole thing. And I think it's a real disservice just to show that first clip, that attenuated clip, it, because it tells you lots more if you take it just that way than the rest, which provided a lot of context. I'm not a big fan of Mike Pompeo either. Uh, I think he's violated that oath that he took as an officer and uh, and also as being a secretary of state and whatever his first job in the Trump administration was. But I think he's trying to, to do as good as he can and stay in place because God help us if he puts a real yahoo in place as secretary of state. 
I think it may have been a bit tongue in cheek. I agree, but here's the problem, which is I think you can tell a lot by the mindset and something like that. The 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 test to that is very simple. Go go, you know, spend a little time with your wife and then tell a, a, a tongue in cheek joke about cheating on your wife. Um, that's not going to go over very well, even if that was just tongue in cheek or a joke, because it tells you something about the mindset that the, the person who says a comment like that, even if they've never done it. The fact that he can make that comment, even tongue in cheek, as the Secretary of State. Uh, so, but yeah, I, 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 you guys could pick the topic. I think it's probably best to move yeah, on. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to back off from this right now. <laughs> I, I think we have reached a point where you and I are on different tracks, and that's okay. So, All right. I think maybe he was smirking, but um, to make a, a joke about this at, at this uh, point in time with the president's behavior is, is just about the most irresponsible thing you could do. Well, I, I, I've been looking at the constellation of, of things. So, I mean, uh, that it's just one thing on top of everything else that's going on. It's, it's, there's a huge pattern here, which is very disturbing. Trump hasn't, Trump hasn't, uh, uh, conceded the election. He's 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 holding these these. Um, what was the uh, okay? So they just had in the other the other nice thing is on the we have a what's called a Discord and it's a communications server and I the, you know people on in time are always dropping and so I usually have pretty up to the minute what's going on and as I recall I saw something a few minutes ago that was there it is uh, in Pennsylvania. OK, which is where super lawyer Giuliani is. Um, the judge asked the Trump lawyer to uh, to point out uh, whether he was even alleging fraud. The lawyer refused to answer. Here was the question. The court. I understand. I'm asking you a specific question and I'm looking for a specific answer. Are you claiming that there is any fraud in connection with these five hundred and ninety two disputed ballots? Mr. Goldstein, to my knowledge, uh, to my knowledge at present, no. Keep in mind, he didn't ask, answer the question. The question wasn't, um, uh, do you know if there's fraud or not? The question isn't, do you believe there's fraud or not? The question is, are you alleging fraud? His answer is not to my knowledge, no. You don't know whether you're alleging fraud or not, but the reason, that's why he asked this this way, they, they refuse to actually allege fraud in court because it's abuse of process if they've got no evidence. And they've got no evidence. At least that's what that tells me. They've got no evidence because it's abuse of process. The court, are you claiming that there is any undue or improper influence upon the election with uh, representation to the uh, with respect to the 592 ballots? To my knowledge, at present, no. Um, so what he's saying is, I don't know of any fraud, but that's not the question. That's a cute, another lawyer thing. That's a cute way around answering the question. The question is, are you making the claim? Well, I don't know. I don't know what I, I don't know what I'm claiming. I'm just, I'm just here. Um, at any rate. Um, there there well, was written documentation of that claim though, that came in to get him into court. And he's just admitted that he doesn't have any, any evidence for, yep. for that. So, you know, there are subtleties there, I'm sure. And I don't know how to interpret those because I don't know the persons. But there's, the judge is going to throw that out, I think. Oh, I have no doubt. But uh, uh, so the question is then, what on earth is going on? Well, what, what, why do we have this constellation? It's window dressing, of, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I think I, it's window. I, I agree it's window dressing, it, but for what is the it's question? It's right to be very suspicious where Trump is concerned he he's a, a liar of the first water or maybe even the zeroth water but anyway um, but is this all show or are they really trying to to get the governors to to essentially violate the constitution by intent of the the founders unfortunately yeah, the founders kind of put it all on the states there's no mention of of representative government at the state level for yep. the Congress. The, the House members, uh, their qualifications are met, but are stated in the Constitution. They say nothing about districts. So in principle, the states could elect all of the representatives 
at large as they do the senators. And uh, yeah. nobody does that except when they only have one representative. And, right. and we have two states. Uh, was it uh, Nebraska, I think, and somewhere up in the Northeast that actually allocate the uh, the, rep the electoral votes according to district, con congressional district. I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, so I'm going to drop, um, uh, this is from the Business Insider. I don't have uh, the Atlantic uh, version <clears throat> of it yet because, and then there was a, so that's September, so we're, I don't remember when the October one was. But if you look up uh, Trump Bypass Electoral College, it was reported before this that this has been floated by an active strategy by the campaign to do this in case he lost. I think mm. this is what he's doing, and I think the lawsuits are just a distraction from that. Um, I think he will probably fail, but I'm not comfortable enough with that to say that he will. And the fact that he's even attempting is a, a further reminder of why what we really need to do. You can't really remove the Electoral College because it's built into the Constitution. It would take two thirds ratification by each state and then two thirds in, in um, uh, the Senate. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Uh, but what you can do is force uh, have each state to force the electors to go by the popular vote. If they do that, you essentially nullify the um, uh, electoral college. It becomes just a vestigial organ in, the, in our democracy. I There's been a lot of talk of trying to do that. I hope that gets done. And if he tries this, I think, um, okay, so but Trump's campaign would focus on Arizona, Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, is, uh, according to the Atlantic. So that it, it was actually the Atlantic, I misspoke earlier, it was the Atlantic that did the first um, article quoting uh, Trump insiders. So, um, and then what we now have is actually just from the Houston, yeah, you see, because as, as I'm talking to you, literally news is, is just like popping <laughs> open. Uh, they, um, I guess the State Department is denying uh, Biden access to his messages from foreign leaders. So foreign leaders have been uh, sending him messages, uh, most of them of congratulations, and the State Department is holding on to them and refuses to give them to him. So um, I, that's just another, it's, it's, it could turn on a dime. I, I've heard and believe, believe it or not, I to give some credence to this. Again, he's going to go to Mar-a-Lago for a vacation. He goes down there and thinks, hey, never come. I don't know. I think that's a possibility. But the, realistically speaking, I think he's a narcissist. Um, I, I, there was a, uh, 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 I'll hit this real quick. And then I'll, yeah, uh, I think he's a narcissist. I think he refuses to admit when he's lost. I think he blames other people. I think that's what you're seeing now. He's blaming other people. He's attacking. He's lashing out at anybody and blaming them. I don't think he wants to lose. I don't think he wants to go back to the White House, but he doesn't want to lose. And I think he wants the legal protection of being president until he figures out how he's going to get himself out of the mess he's in, uh, which I don't think he can do. So um, I think he's desperate and I think he's panicking. And I think it's going to be an interesting 72 days. Yeah, what was your question? I think that's all true, but we're talking about Trump and we're talking about legality, and those two things do not go together. Trump will do whatever he can get away with, whatever, if he can get away with calling out the troops, I mean, who knows what this man is capable of. I don't think he has any limits. Uh, I think pencil certify. I think so long as it, if the electoral delegates are assigned the way they're supposed to be. Um, I think Pence will certify. I think Trump will instruct him not to. I think Pence will certify again because Pence does believe in the process of law, and he he did as a senator. He was he's not going to go before the Senate as a former senator. Uh, he's not going to go before them as the head of Senate and refuse to certify. Uh, and that would throw in a crisis the likes. Of, he doesn't want to go down as the the man who just created the worst constitutional crisis in this country's history. So. He will certify. If it's certified, Trump can do whatever he likes. But January 20th, the Secret Service will remove him. His feet may or may not hit the floor on the way out, depending on how much he sticks around. But they will remove him. Um, sure. So uh, it's up to the Senate to certify. And I, I don't anticipate a problem there. Where I anticipate the problem is with the Electoral College. Um, I think you give Pence so much credit, you know. We think of, 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 the, of the senators, uh, the Republican senators who used to have 
a, a more kind of believable voice in the Senate uh, in the past, like Lindsey Graham. And you wonder where have those people gone? They really have stuck to, uh, to Trump all the way. And to me, there is nothing that they won't do because they have tasted this kind of power and because they're afraid of what's coming in terms of the demographics of this country and whether or not you know, they and people like they are gonna be able to stay in power forever and ever. So I hope you're right about Pence, uh, but I am very skeptical about it. Uh, and uh, in any case, there's nothing I can do about it. Right? You know, all we can do is see what happens. And of course, go out in the streets if we, if we need to and advocate for what we believe in. But we're sort of like spectators here for the time being. I think that's true uh, to some extent. I run an education and news show. And I do that on the grounds that an informed public in and of itself adds, uh, applies pressure to, to these systems. Um, so um, I, I'm proud to be able to sit there and say, okay, this is what's going on. But um, I haven't been asked very often, although I think it did actually, in fact, I know who, there was a guy, a regular of ours, who, who just sort of sat there and said, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. So <laughs> I was just like, okay, well, uh, on some level, there's truth to that, but on, on the other uh, level, they are all aware that they need to run for election again. They all they are aware that um, the more people get upset by this, even if they can't do anything now, people will remember. And again, Pence is aware of that. Pence Pence is, has mastered uh, enlightened self interest. He knows that this is going to be history, and he doesn't want to be on the wrong side of it. He spent too much time being a choir boy to be on the wrong side of history. And he knows anything that's gonna throw into a constitutional crisis. If this has been, and the way I know that is because he actually, he won't come up, he won't come up and, and kiss Trump's butt um, every time Trump comes up and says something stupid, he stays away. Why? Because he knows it's stupid and he doesn't want to be associated with it. Uh, he's sane. Uh, that's the difference between the two. So I, I think he'll certify. Um, and that then, Next time around, he can be. He, uh, next time around, he's going to go for president. Uh, but if he doesn't certify, ho ho ho, his career is probably over, and he go, goes down as more hated than Mitch McConnell. Which that's saying something. That takes that takes Mitch McConnell's going to earn a special place. But to to get to you've been talking about what the Senate is like now. That's Mitch McConnell's influence. So if you really want to talk about the influence of, of uh, leadership and how um, attitude is reflected by leadership. Mitch McConnell doesn't care about the rules. He doesn't care about anything. He's 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 Trump, but with a brain and sane. I mean, he's he's sane. He's he's insidious. He's he's he doesn't care about anything really except himself and his. But uh, and he'll break all the rules. Does doesn't care. Nothing is sacrosanct to him. But he's smart. Not uber smart, but he's smart enough. He he doesn't do self inflicted wounds the same way. I mean, Trump just can't figure anything out. Um, and he's aware, and there are people who are aware, and this is the other problem. Um, we have, we have, uh, the other nice thing I like about our show is people can call in, people can engage, and as we're doing the stream, people can actually interact. And on rare occasion, we have people who will bring in just as guests, someone will show up and say, and we, well, there's a guy that we know is, who's uh, a conservative who, I, I like the guy because even though I disagree with him on most issues, he comes by all of his disagreements with me very honestly. He, he, he owns guns. Uh, he, he likes this. He loves the second amendment, but he's not, he's not a, Oh, I just, I love guns and I like the feel of, or even a, you know, I'm going to protect my family. Although there's an element of that, but you talk to him about guns. He's got some really great points. And you're just like, wow, that's really, he knows what he's. So he comes, he comes along and we talk all the time. But one of the things he said is, look, if I knew for a fact that Republicans would stay in power, Maybe I'd be okay with some of the dismantling of these systems because I'd say to myself, if I wasn't ethical, I'd say to myself, hey, this makes it easier for us to do what's best for the country. But the reality is the Dems are going to get back into power at some point soon, and I don't want them having the power that Trump wants today. I don't want them having the ability to overturn the vote by just having enough governors. No, my vote matters. So I don't care if I – if. I'm one of these, you know, Republicans need to win because it's what's good for the country. What's best for the country is that we follow the process, because if we violate it for ourselves, it will be violated. And he's and he, he talked about the stacking of the Supreme Court. 
Um, if there's 50, I think they can do it with 50 in the Senate. If there's 50 Democrats in the Senate, and if there's, um, uh, what is it? Uh, if if uh, Biden goes in, we got 50 in the Senate. One of the first things he's going to do is try to expand the court by two. Now, um, a lot of people object to this. I'm not a fan of it because are you just going to do this every time you don't like the balance of the court? But the reality is the court has been stacked and it was stacked when they denied Garland, when they denied Obama, what constitutionally he had at least had a right to hear. Now, I think uh, uh, Keith Hassett, um, uh, silence implies consent. I, I made the argument. I was actually tweeting at Obama like every day. I was just like, look, the, the, the Senate has said they won't even hear it. They won't talk. That's silence. Silence implies consent. You need consent to the Senate, but it doesn't say what consent means. In the law, silence implies consent. You gave them 30 days. They didn't do anything. Done. Put Merrick Garland on the bench, and if they say they got a problem with it, let it go to court. At any rate, they did what they did. Um, now, but, uh, it, the, the, because of the extreme imbalance, they add two Democrats to, or two liberals to the court. It's still balanced towards a conservative. That's fine. There's always going to be a balance one way or another, but it's not stacked anymore. But this this buddy of mine, the, the conservative, is like, look, I hate that they're doing it. But of course they're doing it because we started this process by completely undermining. You know, we didn't give them the right to at least have uh, Garland have the nomination process. We did none of that. So now they get into office and they say, we're just going to add two seats. And they can. We, we could do what we – this is the brinksmanship. And so – most conservatives that I've spoken with really don't like most of this, and there are a number who are speaking out. But the problem is the it's easier to get elected with the politics of division. I hate to say that because it's so trite and everybody uses it all the time, but it's easier because we react to fear much better and much more powerfully than we do to hope. Losses loom larger. We are more afraid of losing what we have if somebody says, hey, you're going to get free health care, it's like, hey, great. That's awesome. That's great. Somebody else says, oh, but you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose this to an immigrant. So this, that, so that gets the endorphins going in a very different way. Than, so um, it's easier to get elected that way, but it undermines the stability of the country. It undermines the stability of your administration, so on and so forth. So you end up having to undo that. So it's, it's the kind of brinksmanship where you have uh, the, a game of chicken where two cars are headed down. Uh, towards a cliff and you see who stops first and who accidentally drives off the cliff and it's about getting as close to the cliff as possible without actually going off but in those kinds of games you play long enough it incentivizes towards both sides driving off the cliff that's what's going to happen so um that's where we are and mitch mcconnell is the ultimate expression of that I, um uh, randy in the uh chat has asked uh, about the senate he, he says uh, that uh, this um, denying the election is all to keep the Trump base fired up uh, for the Georgia Senate runoffs, and they're just trying to drag it out. They're they're raking in money. Um, so, uh, what do you think of, of that hypothesis? I think that's not a bad theory. I think there are probably some people who are doing that. I think if they are trying that, it's going to bite them in the end because uh, I mean they'll have to pivot at some point. At some point, they'll have to pivot and say. Well, if you want to correct what happened to Trump, you have to you have to uh, uh, vote for the Republicans in the Georgia runoff. Um, I Take a look don't at the question before that. Look at just oh. above that about with the certifications. Uh, yeah, December first appears to be the latest state certification date. Isn't this likely? Randy asks when uh, many Republicans will stop denying the obvious. Um, I would have thought the election would be when people would stop denying the obvious. Uh, the reality the is, projection. again, once you... Oh, I'm sorry, what? Legally, that's just media projections. That's not the count. Oh, yeah, yeah. The certification isn't the count either. The count is what the Electoral College does. So until no, the Electoral no, no, College no, no, votes, no, no, they no. can deny it. Certification is the state's official recognition of the vote in their state. Yes. We don't have that yes. yet. Well, once they've got it, so what? So then I think a lot of people will have to make a choice. Why? There's the electors haven't voted. The electors, if uh, you could have a situation technically where every state certify, every single state in the union certifies for um, Biden, um, certified, done, and all the electors vote for Trump. 
Now, That's some of them. Question. I'm talking about when you get certification of the votes, then you have something official in writing. Yeah. Then the Republicans can't deny it anymore. Now they can say we're just still counting votes, and we are. Well, it depends on what on what you think they're trying to deny or where they're going to go with this. I mean, they're denying. What I found so disconcerting is they're denying that Biden even has a shot at the White House, that he's not going to get in. And because the, the, their firewall is the Electoral College, not the certification, their firewall is the Electoral College. So once it gets certified, they may say, OK, the states have certified this, but the states don't vote and the citizens don't vote. My suspicion is you've never voted for president. I've never voted for president. I know two people who've ever voted for president. I almost voted for president once, but I, I didn't. I lost to become a delegate by like two votes, so I didn't get to become a delegate. But I've never voted for president. Only the delegates have voted for president. So they can sit there and say, well, what's been certified is uh, what the states did for the vote. But that doesn't mean anything. And technically, they're correct. So, so, okay, fine. So they'll say that they'll say, and, uh, but uh, we're talking to the governors. We're trying to make sure that the uh, uh, delegates are going to who we know should uh, win the presidency. We know that uh, and just because the states have certified, you know what, we still know there was fraud. They're saying that there's fraud anyway, regardless this, this, uh, this uh, court, uh, this judge uh, cornered the guy on it and they're still saying there's fraud the new york times has come out interviewed no fraud nobody's found any fraud they're still saying it it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how many states um uh uh how many the uh, uh, uh who is it who's uh the secretaries of, of uh no who is it who certifies in each state um sorry i'm going to but it, do, it doesn't matter how many uh, so thank you thank you how many uh, secretaries of state come out and say there was no fraud I, I, this this has happened in in um, uh, what was the state recently where they tried two two Republican senators are trying to overthrow their Republican Secretary of State for saying there was no fraud when there was no fraud. So if the Secretary of State says that says it's been now I agree it's not official but once it becomes official they're still going to say well you know what clearly they're incompetent so it's to the Electoral College I I don't see that certification changing anything. At least that's my concern. I don't see why. And hopefully there was a Republican who was, went on record as saying, well, Trump's in a little bit of denial. I don't see the harm in letting him experience that, uh, denial for a couple of days. I see the harm in it uh, because a couple of days is going to turn. That, that was what they said. That was what they said his first couple of weeks in office. Well, he doesn't really know what he's doing, but you know what? I don't see the harm in just letting him do things his way until he figures out that it's best to it's best to actually read the presidential daily briefings and yada yada. Nope. Yeah, didn't do that. Um, if we go back to the founders, <laughs> the guys yeah. that wrote the uh, the Constitution in Philadelphia and submitted it to the states, um, early on the uh, the Virginia plan that Madison had a big hand in writing had the president being elected by the Congress by. Um, you know, the two senators for each state and the representatives for the state. And they backed away from that because they didn't trust the congressman. And I think they attempted to do that with the electoral college, but to have the electors elected directly by name, yes. at least, well, no, by name, just like they do for the, the president, the uh, senators and the representatives. But they left a wide open gate to the states and they most states have wound up doing the elector electors by statewide vote everybody at at, at uh, large except for these two states that uh, allocate the uh, the electoral vote well, the electors uh, individually and i think they're doing it by congressional district but i'm not sure about that and even then, the congressional district is uh, is a chancy district. I, I remember I spent some time in in Travis County, uh, um, where the University of Texas is located, main, mother campus. And when you look at the districting around Travis County, it's a very populous county. It's uh, uh, and with its surroundings, 
has a very high intellectual density because of all the high tech stuff as well as the university. And it's the seat of government also, but it only has one representative. And there are at least three and I think four or five districts which have huge geographical areas off to the west and the east and the north and the south that are like ticks. They have a little proboscis that dips into, into Travis County to siphon on a little bit of liberal blood and dilute it in all uh, the yep. uh, conservative blood in up in the out district. Lamar Smith's district was uh, an example of that. And um, so even with districting, district orientation on the lectures, you still have the problem of uh, anomalous districting. <laughs> But at well, least, the, the, yeah, the gerrymandering. And yeah, if, if you to, were, yeah. has anybody done this as a thought exercise? I, I think you know the answer by the congressional delegation. But if you were actually electing uh, electors by name on the ballot and by district for all of the, the uh, House of Representative uh, electors, would it be any different? than what we get now in the in the uh, complex uh, of the Congress itself. That's a really good question. Because, because I think at least before the, the election we just had, the House would have a preponderance of electors for Democrats yep, and yep. a minority, but a big one, of electors for the Republicans in the in the Senate, it would be overwhelmed by that margin that the Democrats had in the House. Yeah, well, it would be well because because the districts would be identical to both Senate districts, which is the Senate district. There aren't any the Senate districts. State. Well, it's the entire state. The, the dis yeah, but yeah, yeah. The Senate, right. Both senators are up each the entire state. So. That's identical. That would be identical. Right. And then you'd have each individual district for, for the, the representatives. Uh, for the representatives. And then if you just had for each corresponding one a named elector, presumably, I can't think of a reason why you would not have um, the an identical portion of electors if if you if the electors are, are part of a party, um, you would have an identical um, electoral college map to what that would that would graph right on to um, uh, Congress. Except they are being elected separately from the representative for that district. So there is a possibility of splitting by district. Well, now keep in mind. Um, yeah, you see, the thing is, when they're elected. Here's the problem. When they're elected, they're actually elected usually by the party. So no, but what, this is, they would have to be nominated by the party for each district separately. Yes, yes, I agree. But what, I'm just saying what happens now is it's the it's the party and then the party has votes and then the, the party nominates and brings out the... Right, but the you election. still have the opportunity for the actual individual voter to split his, his ticket at yes, the elector absolutely. representative level. Yes. And I'm just wondering whether it might be a little bit. Of course, it's going to be a lot closer because of the closeness we have in the Congress. But uh, you won't have, say, a blowout like 270 versus. I, I think there are legit reasons for the Electoral College. I think the simplest and most elegant solution to this is um, all electors are required to vote based on the popular vote period end of discussion now that undermines some elements of a republic right uh, because exactly. each state is so it's and we are a republic you know and to the republic for which it stands speak the, the the you know we don't we're not a democracy actually but um nonetheless i think that's the best solution to all of this it's going to be really hard to change the electoral college and the constitution with the 35 states having to ratify and 
you, you can't, but what you can do is get it so that each state has a state law that says their electors must necessarily vote for. So you, you make it illegal to A, have faithless electors, which some states have, and then B, make it illegal for them to vote any way other than the national popular vote. And I forget what percentage of states you need to do that, but if you get enough states to do it, it nullifies the states that don't. And there's, a, I think, something like 30 states have already signed on to do that. So it's pretty close to being able to do that. And then you still have the Electoral College, but it's a formality because they are all required to vote based on the popular vote, period, end of discussion. I, I think it um, definitely should be pursued um, before this uh, constitutional amendment thing. I, I've got something uh, out of left field to sort of uh, put Please. the onus on the Republicans for a little bit. And, uh, and that is uh, something I saw on uh, Twitter yesterday from uh, Allison Green at Grassroots Speak, who asks, uh, doesn't it seem odd that in Ballard County, Kentucky, the State Board of Elections shows uh, 2,285 registered Republican voters in October 2020 uh, yet more than that, 3,155 people voted for Mitch McConnell. Ballard County also has 3,966 registered Dems, but Amy McGrath only got 936 votes. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, Democrats are switched and voted for uh, Mitch McConnell instead of Amy McGrath. And that's just one county. There's... Um, uh, Bath County, there was a mismatch. Mm. Um, so I, th I think this bears looking into. Uh, so Allison says, what are the chances that a thousand plus registered Dems voted for Mitch and a 5,000 Dems didn't vote for Amy? Uh, that sounds kind of highly funny. unlikely, especially given Mitch McConnell. Um, now, wait a minute. Mitch McConnell is from, I want to say Nevada. Kentucky. But, no. Oh, he, oh, he's from Kentucky. Kentucky. Kentucky, yeah. Okay, well, if he's from Kentucky, that changes the math on that. Um, uh, hold on one second. So, yeah, check, um, check it out. At Grassroots Speak is her Twitter. I want to, so here's what I, I do want to do. Um, uh, oh, wait. Uh, uh. I think you guys will get a kick out of this. Um, yep. Okay. This this should be it. Yeah. I just need to get the I need to get the math right. So there was a a, a vote in Belgium, and um, when they did the first count, what they noticed was one of the candidates did in fact get more than the total number of votes cast. One candidate got more than the total number of votes cast. So what they did uh, was they did a hand recount. And with the hand recount, the math actually worked correctly. So they were trying to figure out why, now, and I'm just trying to find, because I can't remember the number. Let's see, it was the, uh, okay, there it is. Uh, electronic voting in Belgium, because this was, okay. I just need to remember how much it was off by. Uh, it was off by, oh dear Lord. It was off by 1,000, oh, come on, where'd it go? Sorry, I can't, I can't find this. And I figured you guys, and I, when I, I, it's been a while since I've done any uh, computer science. So I should know precisely how much this was off by, but now I can't remember it was off by a very specific amount it was um let me try one more time to look for this i apologize you can ask me another question while i look at this it's just a you reminded me of this and uh you know and this was uh okay it was the belgium election 
There it is. There it is. So they were, um, let's see, when they did the recount. And I, actually, Dave may. All right. If I can't find it, I'm just going to. All right, they were off by a very specific amount and I've forgotten what it was. I, I wanna say a thousand, I can't remember. So, but uh, the reason that was relevant was because somebody figured out that, that the number was a multiple of two, where it was a, 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 a two to the nth. In fact, it was two to the 13th was what the number was. And if I was smart, I could have just done the math in here, but the, the, the number that it was off by, the number that the, uh, the final count versus the electronic account was off by was exactly two to the 13th. 4,096. There you go. That was it. Just, it was off by 4,096. Thank you. I just put a link up for it. Oh, all right. There you go. There you go. And yep, it was a cosmic ray. And I, I've had this discussion that I've heard that is still the first confirmed case of a cosmic ray striking a bit and changing the results. I do know if you have unshielded parts and somebody was talking about like if you use a Raspberry Pi, you can all this other stuff. But to the best of my knowledge, this is the first confirmed documented cosmic ray flipping a bit um, and caused uh, an overvote of 4,096. Nine, six. So um, I, I, I thought a bunch of computer guys in here, I would imagine. So I thought you guys would find that interesting but um you know the radio lab did that so uh I, I, anyway was there anything else that uh somebody wanted to discuss or did i did i interrupt a a thing to discuss that i don't remember no i think it's been flowing pretty well uh, yeah i think it's gonna be interesting and uh, the firings are very concerning and i don't i don't think trump has an end game strategy so we'll see um the fact that Biden can't even start the transition. And there have been cases where elections haven't been called yet. Um, when uh, Bush v. Gore, Bush was Bush actually started his transition team. And um, uh, Clinton allowed Bush to start his transition team because at the time, Bush was ahead. They needed to move forward on the assumption somebody's going to win. And barring any other outcome, it looked like it was going to be Bush. So Gore could, could proceed. And if Gore won, then they'd roll back the Bush transition. But until then, Bush was transitioning. Uh, this is, this is, it, it, it's insane. Between that and the COVID numbers, this is, you know, so we, we do a news show and it gets a little, you start talking the COVID numbers. Like, I don't want to talk about the COVID numbers. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's not good for ratings. <laughs> People don't want to see it, but I'm just sitting there going, you have to know this is what's happening. This is scary. So. I, I'd like to, point out that um, in uh, 2016, when uh, Trump won, uh, the, the networks called it that night and nobody had gotten to 270 yet. Um, but, you know, you could see where it was going, but um, it, it was uh, less than what we had last Saturday. Uh, the, you know, achievement of 270 had not happened when the networks called it for uh, Trump and, and then next morning uh, Clinton conceded. So well, and, and yeah. she did, and she she conceded while she was clearly ahead in the popular vote. Um, I think it's it, it's important to realize the difference between the technical reality and you know what what we commonly think of and how the practice is done. Those are just projections. But once Fox News calls it against the conservative. Um, I'm, I'm confident that, they, I mean, they're willing to put their reputations on the line. They have called it wrong before, but um, usually it's pretty good. And by now enough states, the, the secretaries general have, have sat there and said, yep, this is what happened. Uh, there's no easy way around this. There's no evidence of fraud. He's just, you can't shout fire in a crowded building. That's what he's doing. He's shouting fra uh, fraud in the middle of where well, the election's basically over uh he's shouting fraud no evidence nothing he's just shouting it and uh i think that's a that's a problem i think he's hoping it's a hail mary pass too i think he hopes he finds something but i also think that he's trying to distract people i don't think he knows what he's doing but he never knows what he's doing well he obviously didn't know what he was doing in the transition 
in 2016 to 17. Uh, have you, has anybody read The Fifth uh, Risk by Michael Lewis? Uh, anybody? <laughs> because no, I, know who, I know who Lewis is, but no, I haven't. Yeah, the, um, the prologue to that book is a fairly long one. And he is summarizing the way that, that Trump really botched the transition uh, against his will, almost, <laughs> Chris Christie had set up a, uh, a reasonably competent transition team and, and had continued that work up until the election. And the day after the election, he was booted out. He was still on the, the revised transition team, but had hardly any influence. And uh, so... Uh, Trump was not prepared and had no intention of learning to be president. He just wanted to be the big man to issue edicts and well, walk around and fly around the big airplanes and do all that other stuff, but not actually master the job of president. And so uh, early on, you know, he tried to cut the budget of CDC, but worse than that, a week or so before the inauguration, in a last gasp effort to try to get the Trump, incoming Trump team sensitized to risks of pandemics and so on, they had a tabletop exercise given. And they had about 40 people from the Trump people uh, come in and attend that. Uh, Wilbur, uh, oh gee, Wilbur, what's his name? Rice? I can't remember his last name, the Secretary of the, Treas of the Treasury. I think it was Ross. Ross, Ross I mean, yeah. Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Interior, sorry. And uh, Rick Perry, they were there. And at least Perry may have paid attention because he was buddying up to uh, Munoz. Montes, I've forgotten now what that Secretary of Treasury of uh, Energy outgoing was at the time, but... Um, None of the people that attended persisted in the Trump administration because of the chaotic uh, personnel issues that were endemic, pandemic in the Trump administration. So uh, they failed to be prepared for the, the possibility of a pandemic. And, uh, and then Trump complained about uh, inheriting from Obama a... Uh, a uh, strategic uh, stockpile for PPE that was inadequate, but he had been in, in power for at least two years by that time, you know, yes. three years by that time. So, you know, he just, in, t in, in general terms, he, he really fucked it up. Sorry about that. Hmm. But that's his language <laughs> that I appropriated. Um, and the, you know, to get more into the golf game, he shanked it, he hooked it, he took a divot the size of, a, of the uh, sand trap out of the tee and all of that other bad stuff in doing what needed to be done to run the executive department, plus putting in a lot of incompetence. Nobody seems to be giving him any, any grief about that. And certainly not the, all of his supporters who say he's doing a good job with killing off nearly th a quarter of a million people so far and counting at the rate of nearly 30,000 a, a month at the current rate. So those people, are, if they can't wake up out of the trance they're in, you know, God help us. Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, there's, there's good news. I'm worried about organizations like the Proud Boys. I'm uh, worried about organizations that have been told that if he f if he loses, it's because there's a problem with the system, and they're taking it seriously. I'm glad that it's protracted in this sense. If he had lost by 300, if Biden if Biden had gotten 300 on election night and clearly gotten 300, I mean, just loads of states that just, you know, he had 80 percent of the vote in these states and he gets 300 electoral votes. Um, I think there would have been rioting and I think there would have been very serious uh, consequences 
for that by taking this long uh, people have had a chance to sort of calm down take a step back and there isn't the impulse you know you, the it's it's election night where he did hey he's been telling us this is going to be rigged look at what happened let's go out and do something now it's it's kind of mired in the process and that's a bit of a pain in the neck but it's better than the alternative and my hope is but you gotta remember i i we did a we started to do a show i was it was just too much at some point i'd still like to do it to just remind people of how much stuff he did but before he got into office when he was at the uh 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 uh, one of his conventions and he was saying you know oh punch that guy in the face i'll pay your legal fees somebody else said oh they, there was a, a black protester for black lives matter and they they beat him and then they said let's light him on fire this is what they said and he refused to condemn that he was showed that clip and said well hey you know the guy shouldn't have been there they they threatened to light a guy on fire um <laughs> wow but he, you know, the thing that, that I really started when I started to get how a CEO really runs a business and his business, by the way, is looking more and more like he runs his business a bit like the producers. If you've seen that, that, that the Broadway show, the producers and they, they springtime for Hitler. Yep. Springtime for Hitler. You got it. So, but, um, it looks like what he does is he over leverages his businesses. He goes bankrupt and then he keeps the money or gets money uh, back from uh, the IRS on it. Um, and you can get away with that for a short period of time, but it looks like that's where most of his income has come from. And if that's the case, first of all, he's not a particularly good businessman. I mean, it's a, it's a business yeah, model, but it ain't sure. a great one. And that's, you can't do that with a country and he runs this like a CEO. So he doesn't, he doesn't realize the people here don't work for him. He works for this country. He works for every voter. He's my employee. Um, he does not see it that way that's the way it is and he's in a very different position than what he's used to so if you start to look at it really as a as a person who doesn't understand that this is not a business and that he is not the ceo he makes a lot more sense but um yeah. but he ran a trump organization not like a regular business and like a regular ceo uh i i saw in, and i thought it was business week but i haven't been able to re, to uh get back to it i saw an an article whose title was something like this would you hire this man as your ceo yes. and and the overwhelming thought in that article was hell no i mean this guy is so chaotic as not does not rely on any sort of expertise about what needs to be done and how it needs to be done uh he's just does it all by his gut and his guts has got as much sense as his fat butt. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. uh, and if you look at, at the outcome of the, you know, he, he's got debts coming up. Now these are personal debts, uh, of over $400 million. Uh, and I'm sure that's worrying him a little bit. We don't know where he's going to get that money because his income is not that much. Well, he probably wasn't counting on having to pay that back. Those debts were to, um, m most of them are foreign, but Deutsche Bank is where he's got the biggest problem because Deutsche Bank is probably the single biggest um, money laundering institution on the planet. And um, and it's, most... that's the personal wealth side. That's not the corporate yeah. lending side. Yes. And he, the corporate lending said bye-bye long ago. In well, fact, yeah, they won't I... touch him. Yeah, I think one one uh, loan manager did loan him something, and he nearly got fired. It wasn't a big one. Uh, I remember that. And it turned out that you know he finally got the, the money back uh, and interest, but uh, you know, no commercial bank. And I remember I can't point to where where the source is now. Back sometime in the campaign for the nomination. Uh, Donald Jr. was reported to have said and got into print that we get a lot of Russian money in the Trump organization. Now, that's not government money per se, but it could be as good as. And uh, of course, he, Trump was always saying, I don't have any dealings with Russians. Well, yeah. Well, uh, well of course, 
Deutsche Bank is primarily how he did most of that. And most of that was from uh, Russian banks, which are owned by Putin. So, I mean, the the I I think what's going to be interesting about that debt is I think there's a, a small possibility, an outside shot, that Deutsche Bank is going to forgive most of it. And the reason is, on one level, he was supposed to be able to take most of it anyway. That's kind of how money laundering works. But um, what they're already under investigation, and he's a stool pigeon. He will flip. So, oh my God, the FBI, uh, uh, the FBI, or, or any financial institution, any government agency puts any pressure on him. And says, you're going to jail unless you turn on Deutsche Bank and tell us exactly how much money you got, how it worked, how all this happened. He, he's going to flip. He's absolutely going to flip. And he's going to sit there and say, I would never flip. And then he's going to sing like a bird. So uh, Deutsche Bank doesn't want him to do that. I don't know how much damage he could do to them. I've got no idea if they're smart. They didn't. They limited their exposure to him. But, you know, criminal or organizations and Trump has a lot of criminality to his organizations and his business dealings. Uh, they cozy up to each other to an extent because their survival depends on some level of mutual trust. But once they don't trust you anymore, they distance themselves as much as possible and they cut their losses. They cut their losses. So the bank may just sit there and say, you know what, keep, keep the money. We're never speaking to, we didn't just, you know, and then hope that he doesn't try to drag them under. I, I Well, he's going to try, but hope that if they, they uh, sever all ties with him. So I think there's a, a decent possibility of that. But yeah, and I that, think they're going to come after him for Deutsche Bank. Once, once he leaves uh, the concentrated secret service as a, an ex-president, he'll get some secret service protection. But once he gets out in the general public, some people may figure he is a big risk and I need a mechanic or two to fix my risk. I hadn't even considered that. I think it's, I always think about political motives, but you're right, criminal motives. Are, right, that's a right. really good point. <laughs> right, and, and I don't really know whether point. he's thinking about that. I th he's probably really is counting on the Secret Service for ex-presidents, but you know that's going to be thinner than the president coverage, and uh, maybe he can hunker down someplace and keep uh, yeah, a envelope around him. But well, who knows? He has I to mean, worry the about that. The security at Rikers Island is pretty good. <laughs> That's a state prison, is it? It is. I, I, I think, I think have they closed the Marion prison in Marion, uh, Illinois? Oh, no. That oh, was no. Alcatraz on the land, I think. Is oh, it still, okay. Is it still open? I don't know. I, but, uh, I, you know I, I live next up in door prison, to that. I'm sure the guards will, if he ends up in prison, I'm sure the guards will take the care of him. <laughs> Anyway, we right, well, should mustn't talk. It, it, yeah, yeah, please. I'm sorry, I'm going to snack on some blueberries. I'm a little hungry. I haven't, so I'm going up. The other thing is, I think I mentioned this last time, but I also sometimes I just have to get up and walk. I'm in a chair a lot, so I have to walk. And so I have a wireless headset. I was doing an interview once. I just got up and started walking. And I could hear the other guy in the headset. And he was just like, so, Nick, and then I was thinking about when we talk about ontology, and there he goes. It was like, no, no, I'm still here. Like, Whoa. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, just, it's a wireless headset. It's got a range of about 150 feet. I can go just about anywhere in the house I want. I was like, uh, it, it's, uh, it's getting toward nine o'clock. So, I, I think we should probably think about dropping it up. Maybe uh, uh, a couple more questions before we close up. Sounds I miss good. the donuts. Yeah, yeah, I miss our skeptical Krispy Kremes. Hmm. We don't have those out here. Really? Duncan, all the way. Huh. Wow. So, yeah, I, I know there was also the future of science. That was another thing that you guys had asked about, but I'm happy to talk politics. I'm happy to talk about it. When, when, uh, I just wanted to make a comment about uh, Biden and and uh, you know opening uh, dialogue with the Republicans, and, and I, I think that's great to. To try to you know cross the aisle and um, not uh, demonize half the country that didn't vote for you, but I, th I think the way the Republicans are, are playing it with denying the election, uh, I think Biden should say you know I'd I'd love to be bipartisan, but until you guys you know get off this anti-constitutional roll you're on, 
we're just going to have to play hardball. Sorry, but I, I think he needs to do that a little bit. Mm. He probably doesn't need to say hardball. Yeah, He's, he would probably need to say something like, "We're looking forward to you coming back into the fold, so we can cooperate," or something like that. That would that be a statesmanly way to say it. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I and well, I think, he, and he may. Um, he's got a lot of problems now with the transition that he's, he's got to deal with, and I think he's 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 got more on his plate than just about any other person's transition to their job, this job in history. Can he do COVID. anything preliminary wise about getting people with clearances to provisional clearances so they can get read into things, you know, very quickly when. When the Probably gate goes up. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, no, yes, that he can do. I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood what you were saying. Yes, he can get the clearances. He, they, they won't get the information, but they can get the clearances right, now. Right. Yes, correct. And I that's, think that that's he can time do. consuming because a lot uh, of, yep. in, say, Department of Energy, you're going to have to go big on that queue at minimum. And yep. I don't know whether there's anything less, I mean, greater than queue, but at least queue at minimum. And, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know when Rick Perry ever got Q. The, anyway, the clearance process is a separate one. It's done. It's done. I think by the FBI. I think the Secret Service has their own their own process. But the FBI. Well, with, so. DOE is different. Oh well, I, yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, I, I've mostly <laughs> I would imagine. Must, I've mostly dealt with with uh, industrial security, which is DOD, but uh, you know, Department of Energy is. A different bird and maybe there's some people logged in now who know kind of more about uh, clearances in doe than i do i've come close but not not really read in well, protection just, of nuclear assets but not the assets themselves i uh, had the thought that if uh, trump had gotten reelected he probably would have replaced the Q clearance with a q anon clearance i don't think he can do that <laughs> i think that i think that's a congressional thing Ah, that was Set, a joke anyway. Yeah, it's it's not a an executive order like the uh, industrial security is for DOD and I don't know who else. I, I will I will say this: he's preparing to hit the ground running. He's already got executive orders written to um, reinstitute our um, uh, participation in the World Health Organization, reinstitute our payments to the World Health Organization, to um, rejoin the Paris Peace Accords. I hope. He's, he's going back for the Trans-Pacific Partnership because that was a huge, colossal... Trans-Pacific Partnership was not a trade deal. It was not a trade deal. It had nothing to do with trade. The reason it was a mediocre trade deal was because it wasn't a trade deal. It had nothing to do with trade. That was the only way to make isolating China legal without declaring an act of war. Um, it was about intellectual property. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll get back on that. And he's just he's he he knows what needs to be done. So my, my yeah. hope is And he's been really through one of these transitions before. So Yes he has, which is Whereas invaluable. Trump never has, <laughs> not even now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good point. Yeah, yeah. All right, All right. Somebody wanna have the, the last question here? I'll give you the last word, Dave. Um, well, okay. Um, well, good news on the, on the vaccine, 90% effective. Um, so, uh, Nick, do you know, um, if you get the vaccine because like, uh, people could get COVID twice, uh, will you have to get boosters like in six months or something like that? I know nothing about it. I just heard about the vaccine yesterday and I know that it was a uh, 90% effective and that they're expecting, um, doses to start going out in December. I don't know the criteria. I don't know the quantities. I don't know the ability to replicate it. Um, I, the last I heard from Fauci was that um, it's not nothing that he didn't expect anything to ramp up until uh, the f uh, first couple of months in January. So if they've got one at ninety percent, um, you know, depending on the replication process, I assume, you know, come maybe March, you know, the, the, the highest risks. So that would be the elderly and immunocompromised uh, will no, have... the medical people would be first. 
you got to protect the doctors and nurses. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yep, yep, that makes sense. Lose them and we yeah. lose the war. Yep, yep. So the, uh, the, the uh, hospital, yeah, the hospital uh, staff would, yes, that. Good yeah, point. Absolutely. Oh, if uh, one of the 90% effective uh, vaccines, and I don't know which one, but it's one that's been announced more recently, uh, it is a two-shot sequence, not a booster, but it's kind of like the uh, Singrix, uh, 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 geez, I can't remember the name of the shingles. Shingles? Shingles. Yeah, yeah, shingles. You get one, and then a month later, you get the, the number two. Uh so it, it's going to be a two-shot thing, and it has to be kept at a very low temperature. So, well, good and luck I, with I that. Just realized, I think your question was slightly different than the one I answered. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, the question that I don't know that is, I mean, if your body's natural immune response can't maintain for more than about say four months on the outside is what the current thinking is. So if you've had COVID, you have limited immunity to getting it again for about four months, and then the immunity is gone. Uh, why, under what circumstances would a vaccine last longer than four months? Um, and that's a very good question. I know everybody talks about antibodies and it's the antibodies that you lose after, after four months, but there are other parts of your immune response that are still used in it, which also have a memory effect and people are thinking may actually retain that memory. So you're less likely to get as sick the second time around, but I have no idea how that plays it. I don't know anything about the, I've been, I've been covering for me right now. It's been, it's been the Trump election. It's been uh, the Trump election. Wow. <laughs> the Biden. Yeah. The, yeah. The dirty obsession. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, all righty. Well, that was a, a great discussion, Nick. Um, very Thank interesting. You. Thank you so, so much. So I'll drop yeah. it on the, the YouTube on our NMSR uh, channel, the NMSR, in a, in a couple days, probably. Perfect. And uh, very interesting. Thanks, thanks, thanks again. Thanks for uh, dropping in all the way from Boston. My pleasure. Thank you for the invite. And, uh, you know, if you want me back, just let me know. I thoroughly enjoyed it. But uh, yeah, maybe in a, a few you. months when, when we've had yeah. time to evaluate some of these uh, hypotheses i uh, would love to have you back look forward to it all, all right folks good. have a have a marvelous evening all right good night everybody all right. good night. take care all right see you on the flip flop <laughs>